So we're, we're going to, uh, to start with the health transparency uh, uh, rules that have started uh, back in 2021, some of the regulations that came down. I mean, I know uh, back in the fall, there was a, a big push um, you know, for the transparency and coverage rules. You saw that then all of a sudden there was legislation on no surprise billing, uh, that whole act that was, was out there, other transparency rules that came together. And so because of all of this, there was the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the CAA. You may have heard that acronym. I know we've been talking about it the last couple of briefings, uh, just upcoming things to, to keep on the radar. So with all of that, uh, these you know, kind of a, a storm of regulations uh, that, have, that have come down, I, I think it's important that we, we understand what the plan sponsors are uh are supposed to, to do with all of it. There's a lot of questions that our compliance team, as well as our teams in the field have been getting about this. So Dan, as always, I'm gonna start with you to kind of add some clarity as to with all of this stuff that has happened and with the CAA, give us an idea of what we're, we're in, into here. What we have to look forward to. Yeah, definitely. I think I think all the things you just mentioned, right? All that, that stuff kind of happened in the fall and the winter of 2020 and just to kind of, bring some more clarity as to what's been going on more recently, you know, basically all of 2021, we just got a ton of regulations and guidance kind of explaining what uh, plan sponsors and insurance carriers and providers have to do with, with regard to these transparency rules. Um, and then really the big news, I think probably the best news you should say, or especially for employers, um, and, you know, and, and, and insurers out there was that back in late August of 2021, um, the agency, all the agencies that were implementing all these new transparency rules um, decided to push back several of their compliance deadlines and enforcement uh, dates, and in some cases into 2023. And we're not going to read through all those things here, but um, we do have a, a really good e-alert about them that um, we're going to post in the chat from August 30th. Um, and, the, you know, basically just to kind of give a quick summary, the agencies decided to delay um, the effective dates or enforcement dates of um, the requirement to disclose new advanced explanations of benefits, um, providing good faith estimates of out-of-pocket costs for scheduled medical services, the requirement to implement a price comparison tool to enable participants to compare cost sharing amounts uh, for specific network providers, um, the requirement to report drug cost information to federal regulators, um, and a requirement to disclose to the public in three machine-readable files, health plan pricing information, um, related to in-network rates and out-of-network allowed costs in prescription drug prices. So all of those things essentially got pushed back. And now while that was definitely a great thing, very good thing for employers and, and sponsors out there, um, as well as TPAs, insurers, everyone was really happy about that, um, especially if they weren't ready to implement those different parts of the rules, uh, many of which were slated to go into effect January 1st of 2022. Um, uh, the bad side of all of this news was that it lulled many of us into a false sense that uh, that there was nothing we had to do to comply, right? Um, and that, that was, you know, with, with regard to transparency rules, but that definitely wasn't the case. We've seen this play out before. I know we've, we've given the example about information reporting. It's not going to apply. It's not, we're not, that don't have to worry about it. And then, of course, we do. So here we are, transparency rules, nothing to do. But uh, turns out maybe we need to do something. Or, or more importantly, may, maybe we needed to be doing something already. Uh, so what do we need to do or should have been planning to do all along? Exactly. I think that's the best way to look at it. And I think that's what I, what I think we're all hoping to be, to be the focus for today, right? Is like, what do we do? What should we have been doing, right? As well as what do we, what do we need to be doing now, right? That we should have been doing, um, you know, at least for some of this. So there's two really important rules here um, that sponsors of both fully insured and self-insured plans really need to make sure that they're doing now and that they should have been doing. Um, and these are rules that they may not be fully aware of. Um, and they're important because both of these rules um, are enforcement priorities or, or audit priorities for the Department of Labor's uh, Employee Benefit Security Administration. So in other words, these things are much more likely to come up in audits now than they have in, uh, during prior administrations. These were never enforcement priorities of prior administrations, even the Obama administration. So the first one is that uh, plan sponsors um, should have been, that they should have been doing is since February 10th of 2021, um, plan sponsors are required to disclose a comparative NQTL analysis under the mental health parity laws as amended by the CAA. And the second big requirement um, that employers and sponsors need to be doing now is making sure that their health and welfare plan service providers 
including brokers and consultants like us, um, are charging them reasonable compensation and fully disclosing all direct and indirect compensation of $1,000 or more on all group health plans. So those are the two big rules there. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yeah. Time out a second. Yeah. You did it again, Dan. You, you, <laughs> you threw out an acronym that I'm not familiar with, uh, if you don't mind, because if I'm not familiar with it, it means that there's at least one other person that doesn't know what it means. NQTL. I don't even want to guess. Yeah, no. So, and, and I, and I, it stands for something that even sounds even more complicated, non-quantitative treatment limitations, which is like, well, what is that? And so just to kind of back up a little bit here, try to do this in as much plain English as I can. Um, the CAA requires health plans and insurers, uh, requires that they provide both medical, you know, if, if your health plan or insurer is providing both medical benefits and mental health or substance use disorder benefits, um, those plans and insurers are required to, um, perform and document what's called a comparative analysis uh, of the design and application of any of these non-quantitative treatment limitations um, that are imposed on the mental health and substance abuse benefits. So again, that, that still sounds confusing, but in plain English, generally speaking, these NQTLs are non-numerical limits on the scope or the time duration of the benefits. Um, and these can include things like prior authorization requirements or uh, limits on, you know, limitations on paying for higher cost therapies until lower cost therapies have been shown not to work. Uh, for example, step therapy or what are sometimes referred to as uh, fail first policies and limits on access to at a network providers, things like that. And so the concern here, um, you know, the reason why they, the, the agencies want to look very closely at these NQTLs is that um, they're concerned that plans are being designed to unfairly place too many limits and restrictions on the mental health and substance abuse side of the house um, of a plan's um, health care offerings. And so, you know, beginning in February 10th, beginning on February 10th of 2021, so the beginning of last year, um, this comparative analysis uh, and very specific information about the NQTLs of the plan uh, are, are required to be made available to an applicable state or federal agency upon request. Um, and specifically, Congress even actually uh, directed the Department of Labor, Health and Human Services, and the IRS to each collect a minimum of 20 analyses uh, per year. Um, and if the applicable agency determines that a plan or issuer is not in compliance um, and that, and that non-compliance is not corrected within a 45-day period, then, um, then that plan or issuer is required to notify all individuals. Um, the, uh, the plan or issuer will be required to notify all individuals enrolled um, that the federal agency says the federal agency has determined it's not in compliance. So that's not a good thing, right? Um, and and I think just to kind of even give a little bit more context here, um, you know, what we saw just from sort of from the plan side of things is just you know, from the you know from what we talking to our clients, um, right? The main burden here really falls on the self-insured uh, the the sponsors of self-insured plans because um, they have to make sure that their TPA is doing it, um, or else really they're essentially on the hook here. In most cases, if you're with a, if you're sponsoring the fully insured plan, your carrier should have already created this um, for your plan. Um, and you, you don't have really any, any way to really modify that on a fully insured plan. So there's really no way you can really be in trouble there on a fully insured plan, but, but it's, it's a problem. It's required still of both types of plans. Um, but what we saw early, we saw last year in 2021 is that um, some of these uh, TPAs for self-insured plans just just couldn't have it ready in time. And it took them a little bit longer to produce a copy of this NQTL analysis, which, okay, maybe that was okay back in, you know, the beginning of February, 2021, but that's not okay now. So if you're, you know, I think it's certainly a reason to be looking at getting a new TPA if your TPA is, has not prepared that for you um, by now. And so, um, you know, especially because this is now a, a, a enforcement priority for the Biden administration. So, how, how, you know, the, the one thing that you mentioned about uh, reasonable compensation, uh, tell me a little bit more about, you know, what does that mean, like from a brokers and consultants and, you know, what the employers and, and plan sponsors need to be uh, making sure they're being charged reasonable compensation. Okay, what is, what's reasonable? And, and Eric, I don't know if you've been uh, tasked with uh, any questions related to that. You know, there's been some e-alerts and some, some guidance out there, but uh, maybe Dan, you can clarify that. And, and I'm curious, Eric, as well, what, what the field is asking about as it relates to this stuff. Yeah, yeah sure. I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll give Dan a quick breather. Yeah. Um, so I, I think Brian, you know, from my perspective, it's, it, you know, 
where do you start prioritizing your time right now as a business owner or HR professional or just anybody kind of involved in the benefits program? And there's so many moving pieces right now to Dan's point within the Consolidated Appropriations Act, within the NSA, uh, you know, the, the components that Dan was just talking through, uh, you know, the NQTL, I mean, most TPAs on the self-funded side, um, you know, we're accommodating that in February of 2021. You know, you should have received communication on kind of how that's going to be handled. Uh, and then the secondary part that we're about to talk through on the, the reasonable compensation, you know, I think with kind of all the competing priorities right now with, you know, global pandemic, strained workforces, how do you kind of keep the doors open in your business? I think a lot of employers are kind of rightfully overlooking some of these important details. And so the reasonable comp compensation uh, component, you know, is really kind of an emphasis on uh, fiduciaries on a, on a health plan moving forward, right? So about, you know, 10, 12 years ago, there was a uh, new law really forcing fiduciary responsibility on retirement plans. And really for all intents and purposes, it's taking that same law and applying it to health plans moving forward. So you know, what I can tell you is that, you know, I think there's a, a, a new focus on plan sponsors to really make sure that they can defend really kind of all parties involved in their health plan, whether that's, you know, a company like Corporate Synergies as a consultant or broker, or, you know, even some of the TPAs or the, the insurance carriers that you've got kind of plugged in to build that holistic health plan for your employees. And, and I think really kind of the key takeaway if, if I'm a plan sponsor right now is, you know, in the event of an audit, can I defend the elements that I have in place that I'm offering to my employees within my health plan uh, with, you know, very quantifiable information, whether it be what I'm compensating those vendors or, uh, you know, the decisions that are being made to build ultimately the health plan that's offered. So, Dan, I don't know if there's anything you want to expand on that, but that's kind of my initial thought on it. No, I think that was really great. I mean, I think when we think about service provider fiduciary obligations, I think most employers and HR professionals, benefits professionals, they think of those kind of common things they know are wrong, right? Like fiduciary liability from someone stealing money out of the 401k plan, right? Or, you know, someone, you know, taking all that money out of the 401k and going gambling it away in Vegas. And that's kind of the traditional thing we think of as fiduciary liability. Um, and really what this new CAA, you know, fee disclosure requirement does is it really... Um, it requires now, um, you know, the, the plan sponsor, the employer um, sponsoring the plan to select a plan fiduciary to make sure that all of their service providers on the health and welfare plan side, not just their 401k side or pension plan side, but now on the health and welfare side, also have to um, abide by fiduciary standards or you know, provide them with reasonable compensation, I mean, so that they can provide, can, can abide by the fiduciary standards, I meant to say, right? And so what that means is that um, you know, really the responsibility, that's the real kicker, I think, here is that, right, the, the responsibility is on the employers and the plan sponsors to, to designate this plan fiduciary to make sure that those brokers, consultants, all these other plan service providers um, are, are providing reasonable compensation and disclosing what their services are for what they're getting paid for. And that's a whole, that's a big game changer in the industry. And it, and it, and it really started, it started, went into effect December 27th. Um, right for all, all new contracts or um, you know services entered you know with covered service providers um, on or after December 27th of 2021, and so it's a huge game changer for our industry. And we're not really seeing a lot of clients out there changing the way that they do things. Right? We don't necessarily. We do have some that are really on top of things, and you know they've created maybe a fiduciary committee or they've created um, you know they've done more than they you know we, we've been talking about this already for a long time, but. But I think it's just, it just, it's going to take a little bit of time, maybe, I think, before um, I think a lot of the employers and plan sponsors out, out there realize that this is a new requirement and they have to look much more closely at this than they have in the past. So, and I just wrote down a fiduciary committee and some of the ones that are taking action. But, um, you know, what happens, let's say you go through the process, whether they have a committee, a person who's assigned to, to uh, collect all this information, track down what, what compensation there is. What if, it, what if they get it wrong? What if ABC partner over, over there is, uh, is actually not on the up and up and, and funds are, are fueling uh, Uncle Larry's golf uh, 
uh, membership or something, you know, I don't know. I mean, just there's a lot of bad stuff out there. What if you're not aware of it? What if you've not collected all of it? What happens to the employer who's been tasked with that, the fiduciary who, who misses that or is not given uh, uh, enough transparency to even see it? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's, that's really the key question, Brian, because it's on that, that plan fiduciary to notify their broker or consultant or Uncle Larry, if, if that's Uncle Larry of, you know, yeah. the brother of the CEO from XYZ Corp, right? Um, you know, they, ha they have to notify that broker or consultant or service provider in writing. Um, and if that service provider fails to respond uh, with the appropriate fee disclosures that it's required to do under the CAA, um, then that plan fiduciary needs to cancel that contract and report that broker or service provider to the DOL. And failing to do that can result in a prohibited transaction under ERISA, which can lead to very steep fines and penalties for, uh, for that plan sponsor who's likely to be required to indemnify their plan fiduciaries under their plan document. So it's, it's a big liability out there that I think people haven't really even been, it's not even really on their radar. Um, but there are a lot of these things, these Uncle Larry's out there, the golfing buddy of the CEO or the, the sister's, you know, friend or whatever it is, who, who aren't, you know, they're not disclosing the, you know, 500000 or $100,000 they got from that third-party consortium, right, um, in, their, in their consulting agreement. And that's a big problem. And um, that was one of the main reasons why this law was, was put into, into place. I apologize if there are any Larrys on the call. Yep, sorry, Uncle Larry. I, I apologize, yep. Uncle Larry, if that's what, a, what, What's Uncle I'll, Larry's handicap? That's what I'm wondering. I'm, I'm going to go with on the cousin, cousin Bartholomew. I think there's a rare chance that we have a Bartholomew on, on the call today. <laughs> exactly. Jeez, uh, now if there is. If there's a Bart on the call, I'm really done. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, a few things, and, and I'm going to come back to two of them. One, uh, and this is for you, Eric the preparedness on the part of the employer and the fiduciary, this fiduciary committee, or at least uh, taking some action to say, I know what this is, and here are the steps that we're going to begin to take to know that in 2022, we're going to be compliant as it relates to this stuff. What are you seeing from your perspective as a consultant and, and you know, client's awareness and appetite to start going down this path that is obviously, obviously it's necessary for them to do? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, I think in the southeast where I'm located, you, you know, you, you see a pretty broad array of compliance or lack thereof as it relates to this new requirement. I think, you know, Corporate Synergies had the foresight 12 years ago to, I think, for all intents and purposes, really kind of start complying with this type of requirement when the when the law came down on retirement plans. So, you know, for those reasons, I think a lot of what's now being required of plan sponsors is already sort of, the framework's already been built out for uh, clients of corporate synergies. H having said that, I think, you know, there are some nuances to the law as we now know it with, you know, some of the Q&A and all the kind of final details being sorted out where, you know, upon renewal for CSG specific clients, there, are, there is new language that, you know, we, we need to be sure that we're rolling out as a service provider uh, and then I think the secondary part of that, Brian, is, you know, other healthcare providers, whether it's a fully insured carrier, self-funded CPA, a reinsurance carrier, you know, a lot of those uh, large national partners are already doing most, if not all of the things that, that will be required under the new fee disclosure law. But I think kind of similar theme, you're probably going to see you know, some, some re-languaging uh, within contracts to make sure that, you know, kind of all these final details that now have to be complied with for really kind of any renewal, 1-1 uh, of 2022 and thereafter uh, is, is kind of accommodating all these different uh, elements of the law. So regardless of whether you're fully insured, self-insured, you're the plan sponsor, the fiduciary or not, this is going to have impact to everybody. Uh, to some degree. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, and kind of finish the second part of my, my thought there, Brian, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of employers out there right now that I think there, there, there's going to be a lot more work to be, to come into compliance with this, right? If, if I have a, an agent or a broker partner right now where I don't have any 
clear disclosure as to, you know, who's being compensated what and what services are being rendered for that compensation, I mean, that's a problem. And that's something that needs to be very clearly spelled out contractually moving forward. Or otherwise, there's going to be fines and, you know, legal consequence tied to it. I bet you there's going to be a lot of aha moments on the part of the employer when they start looking into some of these things and realizing what has not been fully transparent. So I, I know that we focus a lot on the, the, the part of this that is the workload, um, the tasks and what have you that, that have to be done in order to comply with this. But at the end of the day, you know, one of the hallmarks of what we've always talked about, full transparency, full transparency and what have you. So um, it, it's gonna be interesting to see that this industry that we're a part of that this constant effort on the part of um, everyone to, to reduce all the inefficiency, the waste, and the, the lack of transparency, what it's going to do for this industry moving forward. In the short term, like anything else, you know, um, it's going to require a, a lot of work. Uh, Dan, I'm, I'm just curious, though, uh, your, your take on some of these things that Eric just, uh, just mentioned uh, and how it's impacting your particular department and, and how you are preparing uh, employers right now to, uh, to be fully ready and, and really learn all the things that are, are, uh, are necessary here. Yeah, that's, I mean, what we've been doing um, is we've, with all of our new clients and, um, that, that come in, we've been, we've been asking if they've designated a plan fiduciary for this. Um, and we've been making sure that they're aware of this, um, you know, obviously not just for corporate synergies, um, which you know has been providing the appropriate um, you know notices and disclosures, but but for their other service providers and and working with some of our very large uh, cl you know client self insured plans where they, they're particularly sensitive um, uh, to you know some of the fiduciary liability risks out there. They, they've already begun to start to put into place a fiduciary committee. Uh, in addition to just sort of naming a fiduciary in the plan document, they've gone beyond that, um, but actually have a committee. And a key part of the reducing fiduciary liability is getting things in writing. And it sounds, uh, it sounds like something you know, like a silly thing to do. It, sometimes, what you're just kind of, you know, keeping minutes and writing a memo after a committee meeting. But it's such an important part of fiduciary compliance. And so, we've been talking a lot with clients about you know, putting decisions that you make about the plan into writing, you know, just even if it's a short little quick memo that's in the file somewhere, right? Um, having a written explanation as to why your decision to go with this particular broker, consultant, service provider in a writing really can really reduce your exposure um, to liability significantly, especially if it's been like through a committee meeting, right? I mean, that, that also reduces your exposure. Um, and so those are things that we've been talking about. We've also been looking at, um, just a whole host of things that clients can do to kind of be aware of this and um, uh, you know, some of these other requirements as well, in addition to this, right? So we, we've actually been helping clients through. We've seen in New York, um, already clients have been, uh, some, of, some of our clients in New York have already been audited um, for, for uh, more so for the former than the latter. So in the area of the, fee dis the, the disclosures for the, the mental health parity laws, we've seen some clients already being audited and I, th I think that's already something that we've been helping our clients through and making sure they understand um, what's required. Um, we've been helping them, you know, make sure their TPAs understand, right, what the TPA should be doing. Um, and so we've been in a lot of those emails. Uh, and, and in some cases, it's, it's just kind of forcing some clients to kind of reevaluate and reconsider that relationship uh, with their TPA. So all of these are different things that we're working on, but there's just, it's, it's part of our overall strategy uh, that we've had for years now, but it's it's sort of essentially just sort of taking a big step up, right? I think we're kind of, you know, we're making it a bigger priority as we go into 2022 than has been in the past, but we're, it's, it's something that we're, we're really focused on and, right, you know, right now and, and that we have been as well in the past, but a big step up now. So, Thanks. so without taking a big step, let me take a small step because it looks like yeah. a lot of steps to yeah. get to where we were. I'm on the first, I'm on the landing right yeah. now. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, we talk about 5,500 reporting, things that we disclose already. For, for years and years and years, employers have been disclosing fees and, and uh, the reports and, and what have you. Is that, isn't that good enough? Well that's, well, that's what's so funny, right? I mean, I think, I think that's, that was a common question we got when this stuff first started to come out was, well, look, 
if we, I mean, if we're doing a form 5500, why would we have to do this too, right? If we're already disclosing yeah. service provider comp on that. Um, well, this is broader, right? And I think, I think this is, that's one an important thing to remember. So the, the uh, health and welfare plan form 5500 reporting requires you to report on any plan subject to a risk that has a hundred or more enrollees in that plan, right? Um, and, and that's, that's a, there's a lot of plan, a lot of group health plans out there that have less than hundred enrolled. Um, and that are now subject to the CAA requirement, right? The, 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 the standard is $1,000 or more of direct or indirect compensation from a group health plan, which could be anything that provides medical care. Okay, so that's extremely broadly defined. It could be a dental plan, a, med a major medical plan, obviously, self-insured or fully insured, dental plan, a vision plan, a wellness plan, uh, an EAP or employee assistance plan, uh, a flu shot uh, vaccination plan, plan, flu shot, you know, wellness type plan. So all kinds of different things provide medical care. And so you now all of a sudden as an employer have to think really much further beyond your normal form 5,500 perspective um, to a lot more things that you may not have been thinking about before. And that's a, that's, that's a big game changer here. Yeah. Eric, I, that sounds like something I, I, I should turn over to you too, because you're in the field. And uh, does that sound like some of the things that you're dealing with right now and trying to describe this a little bit more broadly for folks? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to Dan's point, I think there, there's definitely some redundancy to what we've all known for a while with the Form 5500. But, you know, for a, an employer with 100 or less enrollees, I mean, historically, there's really not been a whole lot of transparency regarding compensation and service providers for those employers. So, you know, in some respects, it's redundant. I think ultimately it's a good thing because, you know, if it helps create accountability or really uh, kind of drive uh, hopefully the best outcomes for members and, and employees on health plans, you know, I think that's ultimately the intention of this. Clearly, like anything new, like any of these, you know, 25 new laws that Dan's been rattling through, uh, it's just, you know, where do you find the time as a business owner, as a plan sponsor to to make sure you're dotting all your I's and crossing your T's within the time frame that's being expected. And, you know, thank goodness, a lot of these requirements, you know, the cans, you know, so to speak, getting kicked down the road from a, uh, from a live date standpoint, but, you know, there's a lot of elements that, that are live now or went into effect last year that, you know, with everything going on right now, um, it, it's imperative that we, as a broker partner are really helping guide our clients through, you know, how do we get these things done so that in the event of an audit that we're fully compliant, simultaneous to figuring out what we're doing with vaccines, what, you know, what are we doing with mandates? How do we get free at home tests? I mean, you know, every week it feels like there's, you know, 10 different things to keep up with as a plan sponsor right now, you know, on top of, you know, continuing, continuing to try to figure out how to produce widgets and keep the lights on in your business, which is, you know, probably a little bit more important than complying with a health plan. But, uh, you know, I think it's just, how do you take um, the existing pieces that you probably already have in place and really kind of hone them in on what is being asked within this part of the law? So I don't think it's a complete overhaul. I think it's probably more of a fine tuning of a lot of the structure that's it, that's already in place for a lot of employers out there. Um, and by the way, you can't get widgets; they can't get the chip. So if you're trying to look for widgets, you're not going to find them. All right, Eric. So yeah, just letting you know. great. That, that's what I've heard. Supply chain issue, I think, is what they yeah. said. Supply you, chain. Yeah, right. exactly. Uh, so you, you mentioned the intention uh, behind all of this, and it's a good thing. Using your crystal ball, because um, I know you have one. Uh, what would you say in thinking through this, and, and Dan, same question, what would be the unintended, potential unintended consequences? Because we do see these are all great ideas, yeah, but did you think of this? It's like, I, I know these conversations when the government comes out with a, a law and, and, and a regulation, there's those side conversations that have, yeah, you know what they didn't think of though? Or are there any of those moments for employers that we talk about that could be the unintended consequences of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a loaded question and I could probably go on for an hour, but out of respect for the, the time frame here, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. I think, yeah, there's, 
I think let's before we get into that, Brian, let's talk about what's in effect now. I think there's some important pieces specifically within the the No Surprises Act or the NSA that went into effect January 1st, which I think really kind of highlight the intended consequences of this law, which I think is important to kind of start with. So, you know, a lot of this was really intended to, to protect consumer, right? So um, when you look at some of the things that, are, that went live January 1st, you've got, you know, new ID card requirements, very simple, you know, so plan sponsors renewing 1-1 of 2022 or, you know, thereafter, whenever their renewal date is for their health plan, are now going to be required to uh, disclose things like deductible, uh, out-of-pocket maximum, member support, uh, phone number and email on their ID card, which, you know, it's simple, but I think it, it it's well-intentioned. I think it's a good thing, you know, for, for most people, they just don't think about their health insurance that often throughout the year. Hopefully they don't. That means they're they're relatively healthy. So, you know, it's it's hard when someone does need their insurance to dig around, figure out what is their exposure going to be when they go to the doctor, when they go see a service provider. So I think this is a small step to really kind of simplify members' understanding of, of what their exposure is within their health plan. Uh, the second component, which I think is uh, an awesome change to the law, and it's something that's really kind of plagued people for far too long, is uh, really around emergency services. So, you know, any um, non-participating facility, meaning if they're not in network, if somebody goes to that facility in an emergency situation, the member has to be billed at an in-network level, which I think, you know, why wasn't this law historically, I think is the better question. I mean, you know, most people don't have the choice of what what uh, ER their ambulance brings them to when they're having a heart attack. So I think this is a really good, uh, well-intentioned component of the NSA. Uh, kind of similar theme, I'll go to the, the third piece here, uh, emergency services for um, a somebody that's a non-participating provider within an in-network facility. So I think the Ironically enough, the, probably the best example of this scenario is if somebody gets balance billed from an anesthesiologist that's out of network within their health plan at an in-network facility. So if I go to, you know, Baptist Hospital and I have really have no choice as, to, as far as who my anesthesiologist is, uh, and all of a sudden I get an out-of-network charge for you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars. I mean, that's a problem, and I think that's a really kind of a broken part of the healthcare system. And you know, I can tell you from a personal perspective. And ironically enough, I actually got a call this morning from a debt collector for uh, a procedure my son had, June of 2021, uh, describing the same exact scenario. You know, went to an in-network physician, balance billed from an out-of-network anesthesiologist, and. Yeah, here we are eight, eight months later and I'm still fighting to get this thing sorted out. So I think that's a welcomed change that, you know, for those folks listening to this call, I think it's something that uh, hopefully comes as good news for you and, and your employees. Uh, the last couple here, you know, emergency error, it can no longer be billed as out of network. So if, if somebody uh, receives an air ambulance to a, a nearby hospital, you know, they can't be charged at out of network levels kind of for similar reasons that I described with the emergency room. Uh, and then the last part that, that's actually in effect now, Brian, that I think is incredibly important is continuity of care. So uh, if a, uh, an insurance carrier changes their provider network contract mid-treatment for a member. So for instance, if I'm receiving chemotherapy and the oncologist that I'm seeing was historically in network. And then all of a sudden, you know, Blue Cross changes their, their network contract with that oncologist sort of mid-treatment. I'm going to have the opportunity for continuity of care uh, in that circumstance instead of being forced to go to a, an in-network participating provider. So I think, you know, just to kind of bookend my point there, you know, these are some really, I think, 
good, well-intentioned pieces of the No Surprises Act that all went into effect January 1st of this year, which hopefully comes as you know music to everybody's ears and especially as good news to your employees, because I think these are all kind of chronic headaches for a lot of the, the plan sponsors out there. Um, so before I kind of continue on to part two of your question, as far as kind of the unintended consequences, I'd love to pause for a second, kind of get your and Dan's thoughts on that. Yeah, well, first of all, I just, I th just to clarify, I think the last thing you said, you mean that the person that the continuity of care basically means that you, you're going to get charged in network, even if the, even if like, so let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield, Blue Shield kicks this guy, your doctor out of the network, you will not have to pay out of network charges, you will still get to pay the in network charges. I just wanted to clarify that because I think yeah, that was something I think that wasn't so clear, but I just, but, but yeah, so yeah, least, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I don't, I'm, I may have said it uh, poorly, but basically yeah. you'll be, ha you'll be given a window of time as yep. a, a patient to continue that care. If you were already as, in process, it's yeah. not like out of network goes away. It's for certain circumstances that you're referring exactly. to. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's an important thing. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think these are huge, right? I think these things are so important to participants. Um, the surprise billing rules, we've had them at the state level in many states across this country for many years, but there was never a federal approach that made this thing more uniform and standardized. And that's so important and, and for, for participants out there. Um, and so I, I just think that I could not agree more. I think, that, and it's a big change, right? We, we don't, I mean, now granted, not every single surprise bill is gonna go away. Um, you know, there's, there's gonna be, you know, providers and carriers that are, are figure out ways to do workarounds here. For example, um, a provider can have you essentially just claim, you know, give you advance notice and you can kind of sign something and then that gets rid of it. There's other things that, that can be done. So there still will probably be still surprise billing, but now it's vastly reduced, right? It's greatly reduced the number of surprise bills that are out there. And that's a huge thing for our industry, for um, what we do as advocates for our clients and their participants. Um, so it, it's, I don't, you know, that's going to be huge. And I think it's su such an important thing to mention, um, it, you know, and, and, and like Eric said, while a lot of those things really kind of are on the carriers, uh, even if you have a self-insured plan with the TPA, um, you know, the, the TPA is going to be doing a lot of those things, right? There's still a responsibility there. I just wanted to kind of focus a little bit on that, right? Because, you know, not just in the negotiations with your TPA, do you need to make sure your TPA is doing those things so that you're with a self-insured plan? But even if you have a fully insured plan, you really want to make sure that your carrier is doing these things that it's supposed to be doing um, because, right, those things, you know, can result in participants getting upset, right? It creates noise. They, they might call, they might even start a lawsuit. I mean, it's very unlikely, but there could be a participant lawsuit if, if you know, for, for you know, for all kinds of things, right, that they could say, or, you know, they could drag you in as the employer and plan sponsor. So I just think it's, we tend to think of these things as things, okay, well, the carrier is going to handle it, the TPA is going to handle it. Um, but you as the client really need to be making sure that these things are getting done. And so, I, I, you know, regardless of what kind of plan you have. And so I think, I think these are really important things that participants, um, you know, that matter a lot to, to the participants and employees out there. Yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, these events, by the way, just as we've always said and always done, these are thought leadership events. We, we're not uh, ever trying to be in a position where it's a sales event or anything of that nature. But I think given the fact that we're talking about transparency, I'll reiterate once again that very fortunate that we, as Eric mentioned earlier, about 12 years ago, made it a point to make transparency a big part of our deliverable. And now we're seeing that the rules are catching up to that approach. Of course, not everybody is built this way. And so where maybe we're a little ahead of the game uh, compared to others, and that gives our clients a leg up on, on, uh, uh, on the rest of the folks, there are still, with these new rules, a, a more broader um, requirement now uh, that goes beyond just what we do. Uh, and we're, we're certainly always, our account teams, our compliance teams, or what have you, here to help folks get through that. No differently than the ACA and all the requirements and regulations uh, that we went through uh, with that. Uh, we still have scars, you know, trying to make and interpret all the craziness that came out with that. But we got through it and we continue to get through it. And we'll get through this as well. 
uh, because I think we're built for it. And we made our, our uh, investment in ensuring that we were going to approach the market and our clients like that. Now it's up to everybody else in the industry to follow along. Now that it's a regulation, it, it, you know, they all have to do this. And I think as stated earlier about the industry overall, there's going to be good consequences as a result of transparency. Um, it's going to require uh, some hurdles for people to get over. And it's going to, you know, change in terms of the, uh, the requirements of what they have to report on or the way in which they contract with uh, their vendors and partners. So I, I just... I, again, I, I don't I hope that doesn't come off salesy, but you know, give ourselves a pat on the back that I think that for those that put that uh, in place uh, way back when to say this is how we're going to do business, I think that that was uh, absolutely the right thing to do, and I think that helps us and our clients out. But we have a lot of heavy lifting still to do as it relates to all of these regulations that continue to come down. Uh, I'll give Eric and, and Dan the final word on all of that as we approach uh, 2.45. Uh, first, Eric, I'll let you, you start. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I unfortunately don't have that crystal ball you alluded to earlier, Brian, but I, I certainly will continue to try to, to have one. I mean, I'm, I'm just curious as somebody that's a, you know, self-admitted benefits nerd. I mean, what, you know, what are the unintended consequence of the consequences of this stuff? How do you, you know, kind of take all of these different elements of law that are, either in effect or will be in effect soon. And, and what is that going to do to the healthcare system as a whole? What's that going to do to the cost of healthcare? You know, and I don't know ultimately what the answer is to that question. I, I've been thinking through it for, you know, basically a year now. Uh, I think, I guess my biggest fear is with any kind of legislation like this, we want to make sure that we're not sort of eliminating the incentives that, you know, really kind of give America the best healthcare in the world, right? So uh, while I think everything that we've talked about is, is very well intentioned, I think it's just, we need to be careful uh, with any future law that governs all this stuff that, you know, we're not eliminating the incentive for uh, providers to continue to come up with new innovative uh, procedures to, to really produce the, be, the best medicine that you can find, you know, on this globe. And then I think secondarily, something that we haven't talked a lot about is on the pharmacy side. I mean, there's a ton of different uh, information requirements and disclosures coming down the pike as it relates to pharmacy. I think everyone on this call would agree pharmacy is a problem from a cost perspective but I always refer to it as, as kind of the double-edged sword, right? You've got, you know, the FDA every year is approving 30 to 40 new specialty medications that are curing conditions that couldn't historically be cured, which is an amazing, beautiful thing that I think everyone would agree on. But it, it, it's coming at a pretty heavy cost, right? I mean, every single one of them's, you know, anywhere from 60 grand to, you know, we've got some new medications on the market that are north of a million dollars a year. So, you know, how do you sort of balance, you know, all of these different factors to not only combat cost and, and, and hopefully create accountability, accountability for plan sponsors, but also not sort of ruin what has uh, allowed us to have the best medicine out there within the United States. So I think that's kind of the I think an important consideration for lawmakers is we continue to sort of, uh, I would assume, consider tighten, tightening, tightening the ratchet uh, further in subsequent years. And then the second thought that I have is as more information is out there, right? We've got all kinds of disclosure requirements, not just on the service provider fee side of the house, but you know, as of 1-1 of 2021, uh, there's... Uh, Disclosure, information disclosure requirements for hospital systems. You know, here in the near future, in the next, you know, six to 18 months, uh, service providers and health plans are also going to have to disclose uh, in and out, uh, in and out of network um, reimbursements. So as more of this information is transmitted in machine readable information, I don't know what machine readable files look like, but I think it it sounds important anyway, but you know, if you if you've got more information out there, 
there's more data to, I think, essentially kind of give a, a broader reference base, if you will. And a lot of people listening on this call have probably heard about reference-based pricing. It's been around for a while. The reference base historically has always been CMS. Well, if we've got a broader reference base with all this new information that's being flooded into a public national database, I would assume we're gonna see more and more of a reference-based price plus type of reimbursement model, if I had to guess. But again, I have no crystal ball, Brian. So that's my- We'll cover uh, that on the crystal ball that, live. That's briefly. my CYA as I finish my thought there. I do have a crystal ball and I can tell you that that's the kind of thing we'll cover at one of these upcoming live briefings. We can talk about RX and we can certainly talk about other things. Dan, we're, we're right up against it, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you to end it. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that's a great point. And we didn't even get to talk about uh, the dispute resolution mechanisms within the No Surprises Act and all the different things that, you know, the qualifying payment amount and, you know, how that works. And I mean, there's just so much here and there's just so much data. Um, and, I, and I think, well, I think all of us as advocates for our clients and their, you know, their plans, I, you know, we always think, you know, reducing surprise billing, that's a great thing. And and I don't think anyone, any of us could argue against that, right? Um, but I, I, I am also kind of skeptical in the sense that we've seen, you know, these types of rules in the past, and they haven't had that much of an impact on, you know, we've seen, you know, consumer driven healthcare rules, we've seen, seen ACA reporting requirements, we've seen ACA transparency requirements. And there's still, a, you know, a big lack of knowledge out there about how health plans work. Um, there's still a lot of you know, questions about, you know, price, you could, you know, RX prices keep going up year after year. Um, and, and so I, I think what I'm saying here is that I, I'm still a little skeptical, right? I'm still a little skeptical of all of these new rules and regulations that are now big enforcement priorities for the DOL. Um, you, you know, I, I just, I, I'm a little skeptical that they actually will have that meaningful of an impact on the ground for the everyday participant. But, uh, you know, they, I think that they, generally speaking, are, you know, steps in the right direction for participants, for our clients. Um, it, it's not clear to me that they're going to have as the intended effect that they always want to when it comes to making participants um, smarter consumers of healthcare. So, well, fun. one effect is that you are going to be very busy, Dan. You will continue exactly. to be busy, you, uh, busy, you and your team. Yeah. And we will be here to report on it and help clarify things. As always, I think you've seen it in the chat. Look for uh, our resources that we put out there. So whether it be the e-alerts, whether it be the Compliance Resource Center, whether it be for our clients, our account management teams, and all the support services that we offer, uh, make sure that you engage us every step of the way. And, and that's, that's what we do. Uh, so to everybody, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time today and your questions. We have captured those. Uh, if we have not answered them, and if you've left your, your name and email, we'll make sure to take a look at chat and uh, we'll try to re-engage with you and answer any questions that you may have. So with that, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at the next live briefing. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.